Welcome to the Long COVID podcast with me, Jackie Baxter. I am really excited to bring you today's episode. Please do check out the links in the show notes where you can find the podcast website, social media and support group, as well as a link to buy me a coffee if you are able. You should not rely on any medical information contained in this podcast and related materials in making medical health related or other decisions. Please do consult a doctor or other health professional. I love to hear from you. If you've got any suggestions or feedback or just want to say hey, then please do get in touch. I really hope you enjoy this episode, so here we go. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Long Covid podcast. I am absolutely delighted to be joined today by Nick from the Tinnitus UK So obviously we're going to be chatting a load about tinnitus today. Um, So welcome to the podcast. Hi Jackie, thanks for inviting us on to talk about tinnitus. So um, I'm really excited about diving into this topic. Uh, To start with, would you mind just introducing yourself a little and I guess what it is that you do? Uh, Well, my name is Nick Ray and I work for Tinnitus UK, which was formerly the British Tinnitus Association. Um, And I've worked there for for 12 years as the communications manager and as a big part of my role is producing information which will help support people with tinnitus, their carers and their families. And obviously um, at the start of the the pandemic, um, I did a lot of work very quickly and learned a lot about um, this condition and have done going forward including sort of vaccines and 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 now long COVID um you know I'm delighted to be able to sort of share that information on a wider basis with people amazing um now would you mind just explaining a little bit about what tinnitus is I think a lot of people will probably know but uh I think a lot of people will know because a lot of people experience it about one in three people will have experienced tinnitus at some point in their lives, but they might not have known what it actually is and and a a definition. So tinnitus is when you experience a noise in one or both of your ears or your head um, that isn't from an external source, um, such as the radio, traffic, you know, your washing machine. And these sounds can be, well, it's often called ringing in the ears, but it's not necessarily just a ringing sound. You can have buzzing, you can have whining, you can have music, you can have a mixture of sounds. And these sounds are actually generated by the auditory system in the brain and not the ears. Um, now, everybody's experience of tinnitus is different. Some people hardly notice the sound, and for others, it can be very distressing and have a big impact on the quality of life that they have and it can affect mood it can affect sleep it can affect concentration and one of the challenges with tinnitus is it can fluctuate so sometimes you might not notice it and other times it can be really troublesome and that can be quite difficult for people to deal with yeah of course and it's really interesting I guess with any type of symptom you've got this massive range of how much it will affect people but also how much it will affect people on different days. Um, Just thinking about some of my own symptoms sometimes they might be barely noticeable and some days they're so bad that I can't get off the sofa. So this kind of yeah variation is it's really interesting isn't it? Yeah, and and a lot of people phone us when they're going through what we call a spike. You know, there's been an an aggravation of their symptoms. And a lot of the time it's, you know, talking to people, reassuring them that they're called spikes because they go up, but they also go down. But it's dealing with that. And, you know, when you've been perhaps managing tinnitus really well for a long period of time, it can be very unsettling to find yourself distressed again buy it and you're wondering what you need what you can do and the impact it's going to have and the uncertainty about it yeah of course do you know what can cause well I suppose partly in it to to happen initially but also for it to as you say spike and then 
despike is that I don't know if that's the right word yeah <laughs> well yeah settled settle I think I mean the thing is with tinnitus the brain listens to all the sounds going on around us all the time and then decides which ones it wants to listen to so you know at the moment as we're talking we're focusing on the conversation but you know there might be traffic outside there might be birds outside whatever but we're not listening to those we're focusing on on each other's voices and so normally the brain is used to ignoring all the sounds that aren't important so like the clocks ticking like the traffic and with tinnitus that can change it then focuses on these noises that the auditory system is creating one of our experts calls uh, tinnitus the sound of the, the neurons in the nerves talking to each other which i think is a charming sort of picture um Sometimes you do then wish that, you know, they'd shut up. Uh, and while we don't know for certain what causes tinnitus, some of the most common triggers are hearing loss, exposure to loud noise, stress and anxiety, ear infections, earwax buildup, neck and jaw problems. And now we also know that COVID and long COVID can be a trigger as well. In terms of spikes, well, tinnitus is often linked to change. So when something new happens, the brain has to think about that instead. It can't just kind of carry on doing what it used to do. Now, this new thing might be an infection such as COVID. Uh, It might be that we're having a problem with our hearing, even just sort of the congestion from a cold or earwax. It might be that the changes we're worrying about something that we weren't worried about before. And so while the brain's figuring out what's happening it sometimes forgets to cancel out these sounds or it focuses on certain noises almost by mistake and so quite often when we talk to people who are experiencing spikes and this was very noticeable at the start of the pandemic people's situations had changed so their tinnitus had changed and some of these changes were around whether they had covid or whether they were you know, now working from home in a quiet environment and not a busy office, or they might have been worried about childcare arrangements or shopping or, you know, toilet paper, all these kinds of things. Any of these things could quite often affect people and their tinnitus. That's really interesting, isn't it? Um, Because I think certainly for me, I kind of forget that everybody's life changed in March 2020. It wasn't just mine because I got ill Mm. everybody's life changed even if they weren't ill um you know so yeah you're right it was a very unsettling time for everybody yeah I I think it became quite clear very quickly I mean we were very lucky we were a small organization and we were able to pivot very quickly to providing support um online and via the you know the miracle that is internet telephony we were all able to work from home and answer our helpline calls and the volume increased but also the types of call increased and the number of people that were talking about new tinnitus or spikes in their tinnitus it very quickly became apparent that something was going on and we knew this anecdotally from you know from our helpline And talking to various researchers who, you know, their lives had changed too, and perhaps their existing projects weren't working. Um, One of them in particular, um, Aldra Berkus at at Anglia Ruskin University, set up a project, and it turned out to be an international project in the end, which looked at the impact of the pandemic on people's tinnitus. And this wasn't people who'd had COVID necessarily. This was everybody. And at the time, I think we were in quite a a heavy lockdown in the USA, not quite as severe. And so we were looking, they they looked at what the impact was on people's tinnitus. And it turned out that sort of four in 10 people in the UK said that their tinnitus had been impacted by living in the pandemic and about a third of people in the USA. And that I think reflected the different levels of of lockdown that we were having perhaps but the conditions that people were in and it wasn't that it was necessarily that they were ill it was the changes that were going on around them some research was actually done at a similar time looking at people who'd been hospitalized with covid and how 
that had impacted their um, tinnitus and their hearing in general. And there was an impact on that as well. It was a bit sort of lower, but about 14% of people who'd been hospitalised by COVID reported problems with their hearing after discharge. So it was very clear that there was an impact from this virus and the, the conditions that we were living in on people's tinnitus. We'll be right back. I'm interrupting myself for a second to tell you about long COVID breathing. The fabulous Vicky Jones and I have teamed up to bring you long COVID breathing. We are both passionate about sharing our expertise and experience of the breath and how incredibly helpful that can be with long COVID. We've worked together to develop a course that is specifically tailored to those with long COVID. It's a six week course with 12 sessions, all delivered online. The community feel and learning that we're all sharing is such a joy. To find out more information and to sign up for our courses, workshops and other shorter sessions, please check out the link below, longcovidbreathing.com or email longcovidbreathing at gmail.com to start your breathing journey with us. Yeah, that's that's insane, isn't it? I mean, I think I am, and I'm sure a lot of people with long COVID are guilty of it as well, where we we think that, you know, oh, tinnitus, this is a thing that only comes with long COVID. But actually, you know, it's it's a thing that's been pre-existing for I, I don't know, however long. Um, and people like me have only become really properly aware of it recently, having experienced it ourselves. Yeah, I mean, records of tinnitus go back as far as written records go basically. Um, there are records of kings and emperors in Assyria in sort of what 4000 BC who said that they were hearing these noises. And this guy being an emperor realised that, you know, one of the ways he, he didn't hear it when he was visiting his blacksmith. So he got his blacksmith to follow him around hitting things. Um, you know, so there's records in ancient Egyptian texts, ancient Greek texts, medieval texts. But it isn't something new. It isn't something that's been caused by people wearing headphones and headsets. It isn't caused by 3G, 4G, 5G. It isn't caused by microwaves. You know, it's been around forever. Uh, and, and for some people, it is something that just happens. It doesn't have to be triggered by, by loud noise. I, I can't imagine how loud an Assyrian court got, you know. So it's something that can be intrinsic to people. So it's been around for a long time, but there does seem to be something in this infection that seems to be triggering it. Now, whether that's the stress and anxiety of living with long COVID, because it's a uncertain disease there's lots of things going on we don't know very much about it or whether it's something to do with the infection itself because we do know that tinnitus can be triggered by other infections you know viral infections ear infections can trigger tinnitus um we we don't know and i think that there's research going into that but tinnitus isn't a new condition do you think that, I don't, know, I don't know if you can answer this, but do you think that some people might be more susceptible to it or is it a bit more random? Yeah, we, we don't really know, but we, there's been some really interesting research done. I think it was just prior to the pandemic and was published during that time where it was looking at the genetic component of tinnitus. And it seems to be there are places on the human genome that people with tinnitus have in common there's markers and it could be that some people have a genetic predisposition but it requires certain circumstances for the genes to express their potential in the same way that you know the, there's genetic components to some cancers to diseases like multiple sclerosis so it may be a combination of a genetic predisposition and then circumstances and environment. So, you know, COVID or, you know, you, you're in a noisy environment um, that perhaps if you weren't exposed to these things, you would never go on to develop tinnitus, but because you have been, you may. We don't, it's a really exciting area of research that's being looked at. And um, 
some of the work that we're funding is looking at um, trying to find these biomarkers that perhaps by looking at there's a study we're funding that's looking at twins um, so perhaps is there something in one you know if a twin's got tinnitus and their sibling doesn't what's the difference and so we might be able to say well actually if you've got these biomarkers or you've got this indication then you're going to be more likely to have tinnitus it's really interesting we're beginning to know more and more about tinnitus but there's still a lot we don't know an awful lot we don't know and that's why it's sometimes quite a challenge for people to manage it because we are still working out the best ways around it yeah that is absolutely fascinating um so what can be done to help say someone has developed tinnitus as a result of well long covid for as an example but it i suppose it doesn't really matter what the what the trigger for it was what would they be able to kind of do to help either themselves or with other help yeah well i think one thing is it's important to to say although tinnitus you know a lot of people hear oh there's nothing that can be done there's no cure for tinnitus that's the fact that there's no cure is true. The fact that there's nothing can be done isn't true. Uh, there are some things that, that can be done and can be very effective. And in most cases, it is important to say, really, that tinnitus improves or even goes away with time because the brain forgets it's listening to the sound. This process is, is called habituation. It's kind of like how if you're in your house, you, you don't notice, say, your fridge the noise of your fridge until it stops working one you know there's a power cut and you go oh something's different and then the noise is no longer there you've got so used to it that that you don't know and it is impossible really to predict how long habituation takes um i get asked that all the time and i you know i wish i could say it takes this amount of time in the same way as you know I, you could predict how long a, a broken arm takes. It doesn't really work like that. I mean, it's been shown in some people who've had COVID that the ringing in the, the ears only lasts a couple of days, but some people might be experiencing it weeks or months afterwards. It can be a slow process, but this process does happen. And there are things that you can do to encourage that. I mean, there isn't a drug that you can take for tinnitus. And that's why sometimes I think people feel that their GPs have said, oh, there's nothing they can be, that can be done. It's simply because there's nothing that they can prescribe. Um, and it's the same with supplements. Stay away from those as well. You, you, there's nothing really there that's going to be helpful. But there are a lot of things that you can do to make tinnitus less intrusive or even encourage it you know, to go away. Again, another thing to remember is everyone's tinnitus is different and what works for one person might not work for something else. And, and also you might need a combination of things to help. And these things will take time. It's I sometimes say tinnitus management is like, you know, physio for an annoying injury. You've got to do it regularly. You've got to do it often. You might not see changes day to day. And it might feel really tedious and a bit of a slog, but it will work, you know, eventually. And, you know, most people find things that the useful techniques that most people find are, well, if you've had hearing loss, for example, and a number of people who've experienced COVID do experience hearing loss, um, then fitting hearing aids and wearing them regularly will help with both the tinnitus and the hearing loss. So if you're suspecting things aren't quite how they used to be, you know, talk to an audiologist, talk to your GP, get your hearing checked. Another thing that people find helpful, and it might sound counterintuitive if you're already hearing noises, is actually playing quiet background sounds. So things like a natural sound or having a fan, music or the radio, um, if you're playing that at a, a lower level than your tinnitus, that can encourage the brain to listen to the more interesting sound, 
instead of the tinnitus. And if it's not listening to it and you're not noticing it, it makes it easier to forget. It's a bit like, you know, when you when you were a child with a wobbly tooth and you were always playing with it, you know, you were very aware of it. And then when you forgot about it and were running around the playground, that's when your tooth dropped out kind of thing. It, it's almost like it's almost like that. Um, so listening to sort of quiet music, it's important that it's at a level below the tinnitus, because if not, the tinnitus might ramp itself up in sort of competition. Um, and some of these music, you know, if you choose natural sounds, they can be quite relaxing. And, and again, relaxation techniques um, are quite important because stress plays a big role in the in the development and persistence of tinnitus. So if you look at some practical ways to reduce the stress that you're experiencing, they can be really helpful. Um, so something as simple as you know, 10 deep breaths in and out or other breathing exercises, uh, they can be useful. Um, meditation exercises from an app, there's loads on smartphones that are free. Try the free stuff first. And there's also tinnitus apps that do both. You know, you can get some tinnitus apps that have meditation exercises, but also these quiet background sounds. A lot of people find that showing experiences is helpful as well and I imagine a lot of the listeners about long COVID are finding kind of support from other people with long COVID and that's the same with tinnitus so there's local support groups there's online support groups we offer um, a, a free helpline and web chat you know so that you can call up and talk to somebody who really understands what you're what you're going through but some people prefer a more sort of structured approach and go and, and talk to a counsellor. And CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, has been proven to be sort of the most rigorously tested and effective treatment for tinnitus. So that can be really helpful. The counsellor doesn't have to know a thing about tinnitus, really, because it's about how you approach your thinking about it. Now, obviously, Anybody could set up as a, a, a tinnitus counsellor. So check out, you know, the qualifications and, and so on. And these are all things that you can do yourself. But if you need some help learning to manage your tinnitus, then you can always talk to your GP and they can refer you onwards to an audiologist or a hearing therapist if it's appropriate. There are some times that, you should always go to your GP, little red flags, we call them. And that's if, if your tinnitus is in just one ear, if it beats in time to your heartbeat, or if you've got dizziness with it, go and see your GP. If you have hearing loss in one ear, or if you get real sudden hearing loss in, in one or both ears, again, go and see your GP, because that will need to be checked out as well. But so much of tinnitus management is about the kind of things that you can do for yourself. You don't really need to, to get other people involved unless you want to. That's really interesting, actually, and especially what you were saying about the listening to other other sounds, music or waterfall sounds or, or whatever, uh, because my instinct would have been to make sure that whatever I was trying to listen to was louder than what was in my head mm. because that would seem logical to me but actually as you explained that's actually worse so that's a really interesting point I mean I, I think the th one of the principles behind it as well is a bit like what we call the birthday cake candle theory so if you're actually in a quiet space and a lot of people with tinnitus think they need to avoid sound and you go into a quiet space well your tinnitus then will stand out more it's a bit like, you know, a birthday cake candle. If you're in a daylight, it doesn't really look like much because there's so much other light competing with it. So it, it's insignificant. But you turn the lights down to bring the cake in. Wow, it looks amazing, doesn't it? You know, and it really stands out. And it's it's the same with tinnitus. So quite often people find if they're in very quiet spaces, their tinnitus is more intrusive. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, all of those um, you mentioned helpline and uh, support groups and things, and I can put some links in the show notes for people. So if they're wanting to get hold of any of that. I mean, you mentioned earlier that there was some research into uh, you were talking about twins. 
is there anything else in the way of research into tinnitus? There's there's quite a lot actually happening. Um, and I think it's a really exciting field. We're really beginning to dive into, you know, a lot of the sort of causes and how and why it works. And it's, it's an increasing field. However, it is still desperately underfunded. Um, our campaign for Tinnitus Week last year was actually trying to raise awareness that tinnitus is under-researched and that, you know, 40 times more um, expenditure is is given to conditions, other conditions that have a similar impact and affect a similar number of people. So we've been working quite hard with funders, with the Department of Health and Social Care to actually see if we can increase that because tinnitus currently costs the NHS about £750 million a year. And there's over a million GP consultations for tinnitus every year. And there's very, very little spent on research. So we were calling for 1% of the NHS spent to be channeled into tinnitus research. And so at Tinnitus UK, we're developing um, a plan for tinnitus biobank which will be able to again find a lot of this information looking for biomarkers looking for these links looking for these genetic components and that any researcher will be able to access so that we can make the money go further basically Um, but also it will be a step change in in our knowledge and the information that we do so around the world there's a lot more uh, research happening than there was even 10-15 years ago but there's still a long way to go but there are some really interesting projects out there. Amazing something that you know people with long Covid and I think probably a lot of other kind of long-term health conditions you know people will know about this like fluctuation of symptoms and how you know you can have a symptom and then it'll go away for a bit and then it will come back again Is that something that can happen with tinnitus? And if you've had it once and it's kind of gone away, does that maybe make you more likely that it might come back one day? Well, for some people, they have it once and it goes away forever. For some people, it comes back periodically. Um, I have tinnitus. It's not particularly severe. But I notice when I do hear it, there's usually some reason behind it. So it's, it's normally a flag that I'm either too tired or too stressed and I need to do something about it and then when I've done something about it it goes away again for a lot of people it's like that but equally for a lot of people they have one episode it might be related say for an ear infection the ear infection clears the tinnitus clears might take a bit longer than the the ear infection it goes they never hear or think about it again for some people their tinnitus is longer term it's continuous it's with them but they don't necessarily notice it it's you know it's part of their life a bit like wearing glasses or you know it's something that they can live with and forget about until you actually until you actually ask them yeah so it's totally individual like well so many other things isn't it yeah I mean we're all individuals and you know and it is something that's you know, it's generated in our auditory system, in our brain. And we know, the, and the research is showing more and more areas of the brain are involved in the perception and um, sort of promotion of tinnitus. And we all know everybody, you know, everybody's brain's different. Everybody thinks differently. It's not something where you can say, you know, we're not sort of carbon copies of each other. We'll be right back. Hey there, I'm just jumping in for a second to see if you're enjoying this episode. If you're finding it useful, maybe you would consider sharing it somewhere, a friend, a group, or even on your Twitter feed. If everyone was able to share just once, we'd be able to get this information out to even more people who really, really need it. So please consider sharing somewhere if you possibly can. I hope you enjoy the episode and thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. And I think 
it's maybe one of those things that until you experience it you don't really understand quite how debilitating maybe is the right word it, it can be that that's something we hear a lot actually from the people we talk to um you know they say well their friends don't realize or their family don't realize and their families can be very supportive but they forget that it's something they're living with 24 7 and actually on, on the tinnitus uk website we have um, a video clip and it's electronically recreated sounds of people's tinnitus because obviously nobody else can hear your tinnitus so they've been generated you know and we play that video to people and it has a massive impact well I mean especially if we're talking about prevention because it's like would you like to live with this sound um, you know and so people will play that so that other people get an understanding of what they're going through. That's amazing. I'll pop a link to that in the show notes as well if anyone is um, is interested in having to listen to that because that sounds horrendous. Yeah, I, it, it will. It should come with a warning. It is not pleasant. I mean, I once played it to a bunch of students, and they were absolutely horrified. You know, it was it was fresh as week, and they were all like, "Where do I get earplugs for all these gigs I'm going to?" We we had a previous one going back. It, well, originally it was done on cassette, so that's how old it was, and that was even worse in terms of what people listened to. It was really screechy, but it had this very you know nineteen seventies BBC announcer kind of introduction. The video is a bit more accessible, approachable. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it comes back to this, you know, people say invisible illnesses. And it's this thing where, you know, if someone has a broken arm, like you said earlier, you know, you can see it. Everyone knows what it is. You know, you know how long it's going to take to fix and what your prognosis is afterwards. Whereas with something like long COVID or with tinnitus or with lots of other things, because you can't see it in the same way and there's no things like a test or an x-ray you know it's it's something that people can just not really realize that you're going through or certainly not understand yeah and one of the other things that people quite often say is well it's only a noise how bad can it be and the answer can be very bad you know for some people it is enough to drive them to having thoughts of suicide and, you know, we find that a lot of people, it does have a big impact on their mental health. We know that they think about their tinnitus every day, several times a day. They find it hard to sleep. They find it hard to concentrate. For some people, they feel they have to change how they socialise, how they work, where they work. So it can have a big impact. I mean, that's not to say that everybody feels like that. I wouldn't want people to think, oh, my gosh, I've got tinnitus. It's hopeless. It's all going to be horrible because that's not the case for most people. But for some people, it is. And even for these really bad cases where people are very distressed, things generally get better. But while you're going through it, it can be quite unpleasant. And that's where we're here to help. Um, at Tinnitus UK, we have information, we have a free helpline, we have web chat if you're, you know, particularly if you're finding it difficult to hear or talk or, you know, have the energy to make a phone call. We have webinars, we have support groups, you know, all different ways of providing help and support for people with tinnitus or their family and carers and, you know, medical professionals. Because again, you know, we keep coming back to this, everybody's different. Um, and everybody needs different ways of, of managing their tinnitus. Well, we're here to try and help in, you know, ways that, that people need, that people want. Um, so there is support out there. No, nobody should feel that they're going through this by themselves. Yeah, I think that's really important to say. Um, I've definitely noticed the power of support through what I've been going through. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, th this is the thing. I think it can be a very isolating and lonely condition because, like you say, you know, with it being invisible, nobody's got a badge, nobody's got a stick, nobody's, you know, th there aren't any 
signifiers. You know, you would never know, for example, if you watch Chris Martin at a gig from Coldplay, he has tinnitus. Bill Oddie, if you've watched him do nature programmes, he's got musical tinnitus, so he's hearing bagpipes and trombones and snatches of music going on while he's doing that. You know, the number of people, we've kind of say one in seven people are experiencing tinnitus in the UK, one in seven adults. So, you know, you're standing in a supermarket queue, there'll be somebody there who has tinnitus. You're at a family gathering, there'll be probably two or three that have tinnitus. Even children can experience tinnitus. So in a classroom, there'll be one child. It's about one in 30 for younger children. There'll be a child in there who's experiencing tinnitus. So it's common, but it's not talked about. It's not seen. And, you know, we're trying to, to raise awareness and so that people know that they're not on their own. And we do know from some research that has recently been published, I think it was looking at people in Ireland who were living with long COVID. And about 38% of people reported that they were experiencing tinnitus. So it is something that's common in people with long COVID. And that's why, obviously, that's why we're talking to you today, why, why there's going to be um, information on the Your COVID Recovery website, and why we want to kind of let people know that there is help and support out there. Yeah, definitely. Um, so if we've timed this right, this week is British Tinnitus Week. Is that right? Yeah, Tinnitus Week. It's kind of international, so we, okay. we're not just British. Yeah, it's Tinnitus Week and we're trying to raise awareness of tinnitus. And the theme for this year is actually around prevention, which possibly isn't quite relevant for you guys because, you know, you can't necessarily prevent it coming on from from long COVID but you know we're trying to make sure that as few people experience it as they can because we know that you know one of the main causes behind tinnitus is, is noise exposure so we're looking and making sure people have safe listening behaviours uh, whether that's at work um, you know say for example if you're a tradesperson or a tube driver or emergency services, whether that's from the hobbies that you do, you know, motorbiking or shooting or going to gigs, whether it's sort of entertainment related, whether you work in that field as a musician, an entertainer, lighting crew, cinema rusher, you know, everybody who's exposed to loud noises. So we're trying to get people to be aware of tinnitus, but also to be aware of protecting themselves from tinnitus. Um, because it's a big concern that with, you know, modern life and, and, and what we experience in modern life, that people need to be aware of the dangers. So years ago, people did things that we would think were dangerous now, like going out um, in the sun without sunscreen or, you know, putting the kids in the car and then not even having a seatbelt, never mind a car seat. And we want hearing protection to become a second nature as that so that people don't experience tinnitus unnecessarily. And also, if they have tinnitus, they don't aggravate what's already there. And I think that's probably the relevance to people with long COVID is make sure in everything else that you're doing and everything else that you're focusing on, you don't forget your hearing. Yeah, of course. As, as a musician, I suppose I've always been very aware of my hearing and how important it is. But it's not necessarily something that you think that hard about, is it? Well, no, I think I think you take it for granted when it works well. I suppose that's true of everything, isn't it, to some extent? Yeah, and, and, and I think that's probably why a lot of people find their tinnitus distressing is because they never had to think about it. But there are some surprising sort of facts about hearing and noise exposure. I was reading something in the preparation for Tinnitus this week that talked about hair dryers. And some hair dryers can be 94 decibels. And the safe exposure limit for noise is about 85 decibels. So, you know, for example, if you were spending a lot of time drying your hair every day or you were a hairdresser, 
the noise levels could be reaching you know the threshold where actually you need to think about what you're doing um, and that's something as simple as using a hairdryer as well as the obvious things like you know using a drill or a leaf blower or a lawnmower riding a motorbike playing in a band you know going to the cinema we've measured cinema sound levels at 110 decibels so there's unexpected places sometimes yeah that's amazing things that we just wouldn't really think about um so i guess again that's why it's so important isn't it to talk about these things yeah and i think it's you know it's it's always important to talk about well any aspect of your health but you know to make sure that you are looking after yourself you know we we're not in the business of saying don't go to the cinema don't do diy don't go on your motorbike we're like do it but do it safely and i think that's the key message really for this week is think about what you're doing yeah absolutely well thank you so much for joining me today it's been really fascinating chatting with you about this and there's loads of really helpful stuff out there for everybody so thank you so much for giving up your time today it's been a pleasure thank you jackie thank you so much to all of my guests and to you for listening i hope you've enjoyed it or at least found it useful the long covid podcast is entirely self-produced and self-funded i'm doing all of this myself if you're able to, please go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash longcovidpod to help me cover the costs of hosting the podcast. Please look out for the next episode of the Long Covid podcast. It's available on all the usual podcast hosting things and do get in touch. I'd love to hear from you.